This is the story of how the mayor and his advisers run London. They have their own uh, agenda, which would be a, um, a communist revolutionary agenda. The story of a man who treats those elected to hold him to account with contempt. You casually use words to smear someone who's a giant compared with a midget like yourself, frankly. A story of bizarre foreign alliances. I love you. I don't think it's appropriate for an individual uh, authority uh, to enter into uh, bilateral relations with another country. And the story of a mayor who believes it is acceptable to have the odd glass of whiskey at work. No, it's not really acceptable, but Ken gets away with the unacceptable. That is Ken. I therefore declare that Kenneth Robert Livingstone is duly elected the first mayor of London. When he was elected mayor in 2000, Livingstone was an independent-minded breath of fresh air, beholden to no one. I think one of the reasons I was elected mayor was because people in this city see a city in which public services have been neglected, investment has been neglected, and the quality of life is disgraceful for a major world city. With substantial powers, this is a man who isn't afraid to follow his instincts on policy. I have to say I was impressed when Ken Livingstone won the mayoral election against the full might of the new Labour spin machine. He was a man of genuine independence and political conviction who would bring new ideas to London. The congestion charge was genuinely bold. If you want to drive into central London, I believe you should pay for the problems you cause everybody else who has to use public transport or live there. He also consistently argued the case with central government for Crossrail, a new east-west link for London. <laughs> and his support for London's Olympic bid was crucial to winning. I do believe that for London, the best is yet to come. However, the headline successes have masked serious flaws with the office of mayor. Over the years, I became increasingly disillusioned, and I even came into direct conflict with the mayor over his policy of support for radical Islam. Now I fear that his particular brand of ideologically driven, headline-grabbing politics is not serving the best interests of Londoners. As mayor, Ken Livingstone has almost total power to do exactly as he wishes in certain specific areas. As chair of Transport for London, it is Ken Livingstone who has the final say over the running of the capital's buses, trains and road network. As the guiding force behind the London Development Agency, he controls which parts of London are regenerated. With a budget of £10 billion paid by taxpayers not just in London, but from all over Britain, and a city hall staff of 732, his position is unique in British public life. There's no doubt that the power within the Greater London Authority, this new government for London, lies absolutely and explicitly with the mayor, and it was intended to. Although approved by the Assembly, the mayor has the power to appoint a coterie of unelected advisers. The salaries of Livingstone's inner circle cost us over £1 million a year, and they are accountable directly to the mayor. Let me introduce you to a few of this group. John Ross, the Mayor's Director of Economic and Business Policy. Simon Fletcher, Chief of Staff. Mark Watts, Policy Advisor on Climate Change. And Redmond O'Neill, Director of Public Affairs and Transport. Livingston's team is a close-knit group of old comrades. He has personally told me he can rely on them completely. I think there's no question that the team that Ken Livingston built around him, which others have called the Kenocracy, uh, was very much based on people who'd worked with him before he became mayor. They go way, way back with him. He's sort of grown up politically with them, and they stick together, and they, they close ranks around him. They seem to have come to some, from some sort of left of Marxist uh, background, um, and they, f they form a coterie which is impenetrable. The mayor's key advisers, Redmond O'Neill, John Ross, Simon Fletcher and Mark Watts are all former members of a left-wing organisation called Socialist Action. The mayor's economic adviser, John Ross, who used to work for the Russian Communist Party, was Socialist Action's leader. He was quoted as saying, The ruling class must know that they will be killed if they do not allow a takeover by the workers. If we aren't armed, there will be a bloodbath. 
The group met in this building in the 1980s and 90s and printed its magazine from here. Mark Wadsworth worked closely with Ken Livingstone on the left of the Labour Party at the time and was constantly in contact with Socialist Action and its members. Socialist Action, as I understand it, described themselves as the British representatives of the um, communist Fourth International uh, based in Moscow. Um, and uh, so I guess they would see themselves as the inheritors of the old uh, international Marxist group Mantle. John Ross told me he was the leader of Socialist Action, Redmond O'Neill, his deputy. And I knew others, uh, Anne Kane, Simon Fletcher. Um, these were familiar names and faces. When electors vote for Ken Livingstone, they are voting for someone who is hugely influenced by Socialist Action. Once these advisers were appointed to the mayor's office in 2000, they continued to meet as Socialist Action. Atma Singh is a former member of the group. Until February last year, he was an advisor to the mayor on Asian issues. But following an employment dispute, he left by mutual agreement. He took me to the pub where, in 2000, shortly after Livingston became mayor, Socialist Action discussed its vision for London. What they thought they were doing was creating a city-state. They were creating this beacon of socialism as a state which they were running. They saw themselves as uh, holders of political power in London. Singh took handwritten minutes at the meeting and remembers what the group's goals were at the time. Their whole thing was not uh, necessarily to deliver social justice, but to make London more economically powerful so that they could have more power. And what did they call this? Revolutionary planning. The revolution in London they call it bourgeois democratic. So it's like creating a nation state within uh, London, a city state. So to what extent was Ken Livingston signed up to these kinds of ideas? He did not uh, object to socialist action pursuing their agenda as long as it coincided with him. Once in these positions of power, it has been suggested that some members of the tight-knit group around the mayor have not been following their job descriptions. Take Redmond O'Neill, the mayor's transport advisor, who earns £121,360 a year. The GLA's website states that he is now responsible for transport policy and relations with the Transport Authority, Transport for London. Professor Stephen Glaister is a member of the board of Transport for London. How much contact do you as TfL have with Redmond O'Neill? Almost none. Almost none? This is the man who is the Mayor's Transport Advisor? He's the Mayor's Advisor, the Mayor's Chair of TfL. He talks to the Mayor, not to us. I had virtually no contact with Redmond at all. And I'm sure that was deliberate because, in a way, the Mayor and his advisor go their own way. As the Transport Committee, I mean, I did occasionally get Ken in front of me, but Redmond was always in the background, very, very rarely came to the foreground, and um, I think I only met with him once in five years. Isn't that rather peculiar, that someone who is supposedly driving transport policy, ad advising on transport policy, had no contact with the committee or its chair? Yeah, you might very well say that. <laughs> Redmond O'Neill told us he is responsible for relations with TfL via its commissioner and senior managers. He does not represent the mayor to the board. He insists he attends all necessary meetings. So what exactly are these advisers doing? Well, one of them has been using his office to smear a prominent political opponent. If, if what you're saying is true, then I'm absolutely shocked by it. In June 2006, the Mayor's Director of Equalities and Policing, Lee Jasper, commissioned some consultative work for the GLA. He asked this woman and...